Yeah, um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are joining us today. Um, and welcome to this dialogue, which uh, focuses on regenerative resilience and innovative food systems. We have two very eminent and renowned speakers with us today, um, Professor Ratan Lal um, and uh, Mr. James Ehrlich. Uh, who's joining us. And I will give an introduction to uh, James a bit later. I'll start with Professor Lal, um, who's going to be our first speaker. So Professor Lal is uh, a distinguished university professor of soil science and director of the Carbon Management and Sequestration Center at the Ohio State University. And he has a lot of publications, a lot of expertise in this topic. And he also recently got awarded the World Food Prize in 2020 and many other awards as well. Um, which I have a long list of, but I don't think I should read it now because it's going to take a lot of time. Um, and he's also involved in the UN Food Systems Summit uh, in work related to Action Track 3. And he, he's also part of the Science Committee under the UNS, UN Food Systems Summit. Uh, so, Professor Lal, um, I'll let you uh, start the presentation and then we'll take follow up questions afterwards. Thank you. Uh, what's that? Thank you. Um, can you see the screen, please? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And it's really a pleasure to be a co-speaker with Professor Ellick. Um, I know uh, the family and their uh, excellent contribution to this topic globally. The topic uh, that I'm going to address is holistic focus on world food systems. I want to begin with um, the nexus that uh, soil health impacts plant health animal health, human health, environment, ecosystem health, and of course, the planetary health. And it goes back to the philosopher John Luer, uh, who said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And that's essentially what it is. And if we forget that nexus, uh, we create some problem. Therefore, the way food is produced and consumed affects the health of soil, plants, animal, people, and the planet itself. Um, it has a cascading effect on the concept called the One Health Nexus. The food system, uh, of course, begins with growing, transporting, processing, distributing, using, preparing, consuming food, and of course, disposing the waste. All of that is very much connected and the food production may be agriculture, fishery, forestry, and all these complex system. There are limitations in the present food system, and that's what the UN Food System System Summit coming up uh, tomorrow uh, has been discussing for the last 18 months. For example, it has failed to end hunger and malnutrition. It hasn't provided adequate nutrition, uh, in terms of the healthy and safe diet. It has degraded soils, polluted water, aggravated global warming, dwindled biodiversity, and denuded landscape. 30% uh, of all greenhouse gases directly or indirectly emitted by the present Food System Summit. And the COVID-19 has created a major disruption in the food supply and production chains. It has adversely affected commodity markets and trading systems. It has reduced economic growth, income, and increased poverty. It has increased risk of human well-being and worsened inequalities, aggravated under and malnutrition, especially in children and women. In 2019, December, the food uh, insecure population was 690 million. At present, it is estimated at 811 million. And there are 3 billion people who cannot afford safe, nutritious, healthy food. So the question is how to make, make food system resilient to pandemic, extreme climate, and other stressors. And that's what the uh, Food System Summit has been discussing. For example, more than 3 billion people cannot afford healthy food. 811 million are already mentioned chronically undernourished and pandemic has increased the number anywhere between 80 to 130 million. 150 children under five are stunted, two billion people are malnourished, overweight or obese, and 600 million people get sick every year by consuming unsafe food. 
Unfortunately, the sustainable development goals are compromised, not on track, and I'm afraid will not be met. We come to regenerative agriculture as a possible option. And many people ask, is there a one technology? The answer is no. We have 300,000 known soil series in very diverse agroclimatic and socioeconomic conditions. Therefore, to presume that one practice is universally applicable rather being naive. What regenerative agriculture in principle is inspired by eco-innovation, powered by non-carbon energy, driven by a circular economy and green infrastructure, and supported by the recarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere, soil, and vegetation at the bedrock of sustainable development. Unfortunately, the soil health initiative that I promoted has not been accepted by the UN Food Systems Summit, in spite of a lot of support from elsewhere. I do not know why, but that's the reality and we have to face it. And we have to face because already almost 50% of the terrestrial surface is used for agriculture. 77% of agricultural land is allocated to raising animals. 70% of global freshwater withdrawals are used for irrigation. 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions are contributed by agriculture. And yet, one in 10% is food insecure, and two to three in seven are malnourished. Therefore, business as usual is obviously not an option. The question is, how do you feed the world? First of all, we must reduce food waste. We produce larger food, 3 billion tons of cereals, and 1 billion ton reaches no stomach, either of human or of animals. So a lot of food waste, which we must reduce. We must increase access to food by addressing poverty, inequality, wars, political instability. We must improve distribution. We must emphasize by education and promote use of plant-based diet, including pulses and alternate sources of protein accept personal responsibility of not taking food for granted. And we must increase economic productivity from existing land, restore degraded land, increase biological nitrogen fixation by legumes, and convert some agricultural land back to nature. Not increase land area by 590 million hectares as some people are proposing. No, we must reduce land area perhaps by 1 billion hectare uh, in the future, definitely by the end of the century, not expand. So we must reconcile the need of advancing food and nutrition security with the necessity of restoring and improving the environment. It's not either or. Therefore, the food system transformation we are talking about, the idea is to restore soil and bio biophysical environment, improve social equity in addressing human dimension issue, adopt prudent governance, identify and implement site-specific game-changing solution, strengthen human resource development, and create a global science policy interface for sustainable food system. What is nature positive? The idea is protect, manage, and restore soil, strengthen biodiversity, improve water quality and renewability, adapt negative emission farming, not zero emission, negative emission farming. Reduce input of chemicals, use biostimulants and organic amendments, promote biocircular economy, support the One Health concept, which I've already stated what it is, and use digital innovation such as precision agriculture. And in this regard, a new produce, agricultural commodity, carbon, carbon in soil and vegetation, which can create another income stream for farmers, ranchers, and land managers. I have been suggesting that uh, if we did proper agriculture, we can probably increase carbon stock in soils of the world at the rate of 2.5 gigaton, petagram, per year. And between now and 2100, the potential to carbon sequestration by regenerative agriculture practices could be as much as 180 gigaton. And in vegetation, by restoring denuded hills and steep landscape and extra, another 150, together 330 gigaton 
which translates to about 155 parts per million drawdown of atmosphere CO2 by 2100. Therefore, if we find no carbon fuel sources and improve our land use and agricultural practice, limiting global warming to two degrees centigrade is still possible, but it needs prudent governance and willpower. Lastly, I want to make uh, mention about two things. One, famines are human made tragedies. We must make famine and mass starvation politically intolerable, morally toxic, ethically unthinkable, and humanly unacceptable through restoration of soil health and improvement of environment. The mantra that I have been proposing at the UN Food Systems Summit, and I'm embarrassed to say that I have not been successful, is healthy soil is equal to healthy diet, is equal to healthy people, equal to healthy ecosystem, equal to healthy planetary processes. That mantra has been ignored. The World Soil Health Coalition has not been unfortunately accepted. That's where I stop, and I'll be very glad to answer uh, questions for a few minutes that you may have. Thank you, Professor Lal. Um, thank you for that presentation. There were a few interesting things um, that I noticed, um, which were new uh, in the presentation from, from the ones that I've heard from you before. Uh, before I come to that, I would ask everyone who had questions for Professor Lal, please share them on um, this chat and then we'll take it and direct it to Professor Lal. So please um, type in your questions and we'll be happy to take them. Um, Professor Lal, so starting with my question, you mentioned plant-based diets and also um, looking at how this could lead to uh, resilience as well as um, addressing food issues. Um, how, has, how has it been? Have people been welcoming of these suggestions in the discussions? Uh, has it been um, something which is seen as a positive change moving to plant-based diets to have um, um, a plant dead diet, uh, of course, it's a suggestion. I would like to begin that with the US, uh, where the health issues uh, in the different. Uh, this morning, I was reading a report 60% of the population is obese. So, obviously, diet has a very important uh, uh, factor, not only in human health, but also in the planetary health. Uh, this has been discussed. The Action Track 1 was on human nutrition, uh, led by Dr. Lawrence Haddad. And uh, they are discussing the diet, Action Track 3, in which I was, and the, we focused on soil health. As I mentioned, we had a strong support to develop a coalition on soil health program. Unfortunately, I read this morning that tomorrow's summit announcement by Secretary General will not include anything related to soil health restoration improvement. So that's why I said, uh, although I tried, we have failed. Sustainable development goal never had world soil in all 17 of them, none of them. And therefore they're not on track. And we had an opportunity to do something on degraded soil and improve uh, environment. Uh, and we missed that opportunity this time also. I'm optimist, it will happen sometime. Thank you, Prof. Silas. So I, I will have follow-up question to what you just said, but there's a question that is here from Captain Harsha. Um, what do you mean that eco-innovations of agriculture sector, do we have the type of innovation in 21st century? Um, I'm assuming he wants uh, an elaboration on- I'm talking um, about uh, regenerative agriculture, which is based on uh, soil resilience, soil health is based on ecosystem health eco-efficiency of input. It's a knowledge-based, science-driven. Uh, that's what I call innovative agriculture. Some specific example include uh, conservation agriculture with cover cropping, leaving the crop ready to mulch, no tillage, complex farming system, uh, recycling bio waste, uh, biological nitrogen fixation, uh, controlling soil erosion, some of the practices which we call nature positive uh, solution. Uh, Countries such as Sri Lanka, I, uh, I've been listening, uh, reading reports and evaluating per capita land area of 0.05 to 0.06 hectare. Bangladesh also 0.05 hectare. 
China 0 0.09 hectare. Uh, we somehow have to use the land best way we can. And the best way is uh, maintain soil health in such a way that's productive now and for future. And it is not only just for food, but also for the environment quality. Thank so you, that's Professor. What I meant by innovation. Yes. So we have five more minutes with you. We have two questions already. So I'll quickly okay. read it. One is um, Are there countries that pay to farmers based on their carbon storage in soils? Is there such a country? Uh, there are not countries per se, but some companies have started paying $10 per acre or $10 per ton of CO2. I forgot exactly what. Uh, I won't name those companies, but in the US, there are uh, some examples. Uh, there are some examples in the Europe, uh, EU countries also. Here's the problem, undervaluing the very precious resource uh, such as solar carbon. The price should be about $120 to $130 per ton of carbon, which means about $30 to $35 per ton of CO2. So if a farmer sequesters half a ton per hectare, they should be paid equivalent to $60 per hectare. And that's the price I'm talking about. When you pay them $10 or $5 or $6 Chicago Climate Exchange that collapse, that's undervaluing a very precious resource. Pay them properly, right price, fair price, societal value price by transparent and just and uh, method that are more rewarding to farmer than to other organization that are in between. Thank you. Um, so we have a few more questions. I'll quickly read one. Uh, do you think we must rethink capitalistic and materialistic societies and reversing current trends to address these issues? If so, how practical would that be? Uh, I would not uh, mention any society in particular. I think each one of us is a culprit as well as a uh, 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 victim. And that's a fact. And as soon as we realize, rather than blaming others, as long as we accept the personal responsibility, personal responsibility, things will change. If we start blaming others, and therefore I'm better than others are, that will not work. So each one of us is responsible. If each one of us take action to do things which are good for nature, things will happen. And that's the approach I like to suggest. Right, so this is the last question because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, this is from Roshini. She asked, what is the nexus between soil health and one health and how it could be used for environmental sustainability? I had that debate in the UN Food System Summit and I again should mention that was uh, my failure. One health that they have been talking about is the human health and animal health, that they are interlinked. Zoonosis, the diseases come from animal to human. My one health concept was what I stated right in the first slide, health of soil, plants, animal, people, and environment is one and indivisible. That concept, by the way, came in 1920, exactly 100 years ago, from Sir Albert Howard, who was at that time president of the Indian Science Academy. His presidential address was one health, Health of soil, plants, animal, and people is one and visible. That was the title. We, me, few others have extrapolated that to include ecosystem and planetary processes. But that concept, he is working in Indore, central India, where he developed the Indore compost pit, where he thought the soil health was also the cause of poor human health because human are mirror image of the soil they live on. That is the one health concept. Thank you very much, Professor Lal, for giving us your time today, for presenting and also answering questions. I know you have to leave now, so thank you very much. Now I would thank like- Thank you. I regret that I'm gonna miss Professor Arlik talk. I hope I'll get his slides sometime, a recording and learn from his presentation, but I got to go. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay, so let me briefly introduce uh, Mr. James Early. Um, he's well known, uh, but I just introduce for those who are new to him. So Mr. James Ehrlich is the entrepreneur in residence at Stanford University of Medicine. And he has also been part of the White House and State Department Joint Task Force on Nexus of Food, Water, Energy, and Waste. 
And he's also the founder of Region Villages. Um, and he's going to speak on it today, I believe, and innovative approaches for food security and resilience. So, James, over to you. Thank you very much. It was a, an incredible uh, presentation uh, by Professor Lau, and especially speaking about regenerative agriculture and, and soil health. Um, germane to that, of course, is, is this concept that we have been pushing forward uh, pretty tirelessly on, which is uh, a marriage of, of uh, housing, new housing for the people who, who need it desperately around the world in combination with um, regenerative farming practices. So with that, I'd like to do is, uh, is share my uh, screen. And sorry, one second. And, um, and introduce you to uh, this thesis that I've had now. Um, I've been at Stanford University since 2012. And uh, previously to that, I've been involved in, in um, almost 15, 16 years of case study research of organic, biodynamic, small plot family farms and uh, hyper local regional um, uh, dwellings and developments. So mostly eco villages, intentional communities, co housing, and co living. So um, when we started to see the data uh, coming um, about a decade ago plus uh, from IPCC about climate change, um, we, we realized that some of the biggest impacts were going to be hitting these uh, urban areas, these coastal megacities. So our, our concept really was to, to think um, the way we used to think as a species, which was really to be in these um, small, self-reliant uh, neighborhood um, uh, enclaves, which would be able to, within their own footprint, uh, be able to produce their own high yield organic food production, clean water, energy uh, production, and waste resource management, uh, while also providing social affordable access to dignified housing. So there's a marriage here. In other words, this presentation is going to discuss that um, in order to, to achieve symbiosis, this kind of nexus of, of soil health, we also have to really understand supply chains and we also have to understand uh, our um, disassociation really from the natural world. So, um, you know, my research, uh, you know, basically had come from um, this, this concept of the wood wide web, not the world wide web, but uh, Professor uh, Suzanne Simard from the University of British Columbia had lovingly coined this term, you know, based on these mycelial mycorrhizal inoculations under the soil, uh, under the, 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 the plants that um, is really a conveyor belt of nutrients, carbons, sugar, minerals. Um, not only that as a conveyor belt, but it's a ledger. It's actually a sentient organism that can span hundreds of kilometers for each one of these, these mycelial networks. And it, it understands the have need relationship across diverse species. Uh, quite an elegant model, we think, for the future of, of uh, human economics. So we take this concept to the next level and say, gosh, wouldn't it be great that we could have a village OS, a software stack that could design uh, and then operate these really beautiful self-reliant neighborhoods that um, start as greenfield, open, um, either um, you know, monoculture, organic, or just sort of fallow open space and convert those into these really vibrant uh, farm to table communities that um, can house several hundred families or a few thousand people at a time, but be safe in, you know, in their own sort of utilities and capabilities in case, you know, not if, but actually when district scale failures are gonna happen. From a food perspective and a food basket you know, perspective, we look at this, this really beautiful <clears throat> historical planetary understanding of biodiversity and this concept and construct of um, non-till soil, right? Um, biodiverse, biodynamic, uh, farming practices, um, soil-based, right? So it's a full menu, really, as much as possible uh, at your doorstep. And then to marry that with controlled environment farming, so aquaponic, 
aeroponic systems. Um, and these you know, can be in different climate zones, you know, either you know, cold weather or tropical, uh, arid, et cetera. Um, but there's a circularity already between the, the aquaculture, the fish, the freshwater shrimp, the crawfish, different kinds of fish species. Their waste is ammonia. It's then converted from nitrites to nitrates. And with a very low energy water pump, it fills up these lattices uh, where the, the cultivars dangle their roots in this nutrient rich water. And then the water comes back to the fish tanks uh, completely purified. So it is completely circular uh, with that. And, and then in addition to that, we add you know, vermiculture and, and other kinds of small animal you know, protein sources to, to, to supplement and complement that. Our main goal really is this idea of, of a metabolic integration that we can understand residential developments through this lens of that forest floor, right? There's have need networks and a relationship that previously siloed neighborhood infrastructure can now not only know about each other, but they can learn and improve from each other. And, and that's really you know, quite compelling. And that's, again, the, the, the kernel of our Village OS software is that it can design these very beautiful uh, um, neighborhoods in a, in a simulation and an optimization using machine learning uh, in a sandbox that allows these planning conditions to happen faster. At the same time, then once it's done designing uh, the, the neighborhood, it becomes the local server infrastructure that can actually run the, the, the neighborhood itself, the regenerative infrastructure itself. Now, if you can imagine from a Buckminster Fuller perspective, or maybe more contemporarily Elon Musk perspective, the Tesla perspective, that the data uh, can be really open uh, to, to be shared with other uh, sentient neighborhood infrastructure around the world. So that based on where you are in climate zones, this, this data becomes incredibly important and relevant and allows you to, uh, to improve uh, those systems and mitigate against risks. It's really, really critical that we use data and we use machine learning, right? To, to enable uh, a human and planetary flourishing. That is our main goal uh, with what we're up to. Um, and to use that really for the benefit of social affordable housing. Uh, that's a really uh, urgent issue globally that we're capable of putting as many people into these kinds of self-reliant capable neighborhoods as possible and as quickly and as urgently uh, as possible. So one of my favorite slides of course is this idea of these um, multicultural, ethnic, diverse neighbors coming together around the most disarming topic which is delicious healthy, organic food sourced right at their doorsteps. Um, moreover, it's been proven that uh, people live longer without seeing doctor, without taking pharmaceuticals by living in these kinds of, of close-knit community neighborhoods. That in fact, it really does take a village you know, to raise these, these kinds of, of beautiful next generations. Um, very quickly and briefly, the discussion about logistics and mobility, we understand that, that things are happening very rapidly. I'm based here at Stanford University. Uh, I'm uh, surrounded by probably no less than 18 or 20 uh, different kinds of autonomous mobility and delivery services uh, and see them buzzing around uh, all the time here. So it's, it's, it's through this lens that we see that we don't really need driveways or garages uh, that we can actually look at also the future of logistics. And this is really, particularly specific, especially to farming and food, that we can really consider the, the new vision forward of these hyper-local, overproducing artisanal ingredient neighborhoods and communities being able to share with each other in regional strength and capacity through these drone deliveries, uh, drone taxis, and autonomous transit methods. And, and that's really something really important to understand because now maybe you've all witnessed the fact that there's been several blockages uh, to the Suez Canal. You have some issues with globalized trade and ports and systems. Um, it doesn't take much for this system that we've built, this globalized system to, to break. And when it does, means that shelves will go bare. And then that causes panic because we're living in 
these, these urban areas where people are completely disassociated from their ability to feed themselves and hydrate themselves. Um, we have some amazing technical partners. I won't get into all of them you know, in any detail, but the bottom line is very big industrial move now towards this kind of regenerative resiliency. And, and so we take this kind of industrial scale and we aim it in the right direction towards these hyper-local neighborhood developments um, in conjunction with these public-private partnerships uh, with universities such as Stanford and Singularity. I'm also appointed faculty to Singularity University um, that we can really marry this concept. And, and quite honestly, it is about finance and it is about policy, right? Because we understand the nuts and bolts of this. It's not a matter of science, technology, or physics any longer to build these neighborhoods rapidly around the world based around regenerative agriculture, right? It's a matter of money and political will. And that we can do this at the bottom of the pyramid and show a, bu a business case that actually proves impact. So with that, I wanna thank you very much for this time. Uh, my, my contact information is there. I also have an email address, a uh, very easy, James E at stanford.edu uh, if you wanna reach me uh, academically. Uh, but otherwise, I will stop sharing my screen and look forward uh, to your questions. So thanks again for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, so we already have questions for you. So the first one is, I believe, for uh, some of the technology that you mentioned in your presentation. So I think it's Elena. She wants to know whether this is only specifically for region villages or this is something available for other projects as well. No, we're, we, our intent really is we were starting with our own pilot communities in diverse climate zones uh, and uh, emerging and developed economies. So we start with probably about a half a dozen of our own joint venture developments. Um, and that's also key to this institutional finance that I talked about briefly. Uh, and then our goal really is a software platform that's capable of allowing landowners, real estate developers, government, and most importantly, communities to be able to use a virtual sandbox to reimagine their, especially um, near suburban, peri-urban and rural areas in this way of uh, building housing for as many people as possible in the right way. Thank you. And a second question again from Elena. She wants to know whether region villages is involved in any current village developments and she wants to know what is happening in Bali. Very interesting. Uh, we've had some conversations uh, uh, in Indonesia and especially uh, in Bali. Um, have some friends uh, at the Green School and uh, we've been discussing opportunities to potentially uh, create a Regen Villages community um, there. Our goal, as I said, and I'll continue to reiterate this, is we're not uh, trying to create these gated communities for just wealthy people. Because then what we're saying is that regenerative resiliency is only for the select few. And then we get away from really this idea of, of um, a mass adoption and replication, which is our primary goal, is how can we create a blend of social affordable housing and, and create the circumstances where we're just thousands of these lily pads of self-reliant neighborhoods start popping up around the world. And then that really is our insurance policy in many ways for soil health, for um, restorative uh, uh, climate zones and, and creating the circumstances again for people just to feel safe and healthy and happy you know, within their own ecosystems. And that's something that's just, we've, we're disassociated from, as I've said. Thank you. Um, so this is for everyone else who have questions, do type in and I'll pass it to James. Until questions come in, I have a question. So just to clarify, do we have a pilot already for region villages or at least some elements of it that people can see this is how it would work? Yeah, well, we, we, we started a, you know, a first initiative uh, back in 2016 in the Netherlands. And, um, and we learned quite a bit from that experience, which was dealing with status quo, very greedy real estate development, status quo, um, land uh, issues, status quo, government policy, 
of doing the same thing, even though it's not the best thing at all for people or planet, but it's rinse and repeat. That's what they know. Um, but also learning uh, um, about the fact that how expensive it is to even make a plan uh, to put something forward in such a way that we're capable of, um, you know, understanding that there is a um, an easier way to get consensus in communities to build these kind of these kinds of neighborhoods. So we looked uh, at generative software design. We had this concept for our data model for our village OS, right? Which was basically a kit of parts of a built environment, GIS, spatial data, um, climate data, uh, demographics, all these different things. That is a huge repository of information that of course machine learning loves. They can, it can go through this and and, and start to create its own idea interpretation based on this logic of these communities. And by doing so, we are then able to kind of leapfrog the traditional process of dealing with architects, engineers, urban planners. We put the tools, in other words, in the hands of the communities and the landowners and the government in such a way that allows us to create new policies that make the old policies obsolete. That's a Buckminster Fuller uh, kind of premise. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely looking at how we can eventually open source more and more of these tools um, and, and make ourselves much more um, connected to the engineers and architects so that they're not left out, they're actually included somehow with their design thinking, but through this generative process, if that makes sense. So we have a few more questions. I'll quickly try to read this. So um, it's something following up on what I just asked. They want to know when this would be uh, something they can see as a realistic thing that has happened. Do you have a timeline for something that we could see anytime oh, soon? Oh, well, we're, so this is the thing. And, and part of the slides that I didn't show because this was more of a food centric conversation, right, is, is this idea of this renaissance that's happening right now in, in construction, okay, it's, it's called prefab, it's assembly line, controlled environment construction using earthen circular building materials, uh, mass timber, cross laminated timber, bamboo, hemp, um, forced earth, etc., and creating the circumstance where you have um, a cost reduction because you're doing something in a controlled environment, right? You are reducing your construction waste, and you're reducing your, your time to build, which means we could, within physics, build a four or 500 home neighborhood within a 24 month period or less, right? Uh, in other words, it shouldn't take decades to do this. We should be able to actually do the regenerative planning, the permaculture planning, do the infrastructure that's about six to nine months, and then the construction actually happens very fast on site. So the biggest issue really, again, is the timing of the policy and the community consensus and the things that usually um, bring those kinds of projects to a screeching halt and take a long time. We just don't have the time anymore on earth to muck about, isn't it? We have to really get these communities built quickly. So um, we're now looking at some fast track development opportunities um, here in the US. Um, in Sweden, in, in Canada, and uh, most recently in Vietnam. Uh, so that's probably our first really emerging economic model. Uh, and from there, we'll be able to have essentially uh, a tropical also context in addition to the North European you know, context. So then we can look at more of the arid context. These are probably the most challenging places to build these kinds of neighborhoods in terms of, um, uh, as Dr. Lau said, you know, just the difference of 3000 different kinds of soils you're gonna, you're gonna come across uh, in the world. So there is no one um, particular regenerative agricultural piece or overlay. It's a, it's a combination of understanding each climate zone and actually the way our software is intended to work is to ingest the, the land grant very specifically of that place and from indigenous wisdom, 
be able to understand what that land really wants in terms of water flow, in terms of light aspect, in terms of, of wild animal pathways. Um, and, and that you, by creating that, what happens is you, you allow for um, pioneer and heirloom growth, right? Because those creatures come and in their scat are seeds. And so you, you wake up in the morning and all of a sudden something interesting was growing there that you didn't actually plant yourself. Um, that's what nature is all about. There's, there's this just little bit of chaos theory, um, but if, if, if done so in a certain way, the goal of these neighborhoods is that they are like fireworks over a period of let's say six to seven years. They become blossoming and fruiting oasis where they actually achieve almost their own ability to, to self heal in that circularity and that symbiosis. This is, this is letting mother earth carry most of the water, right? We've become really experts at paving over everything, right? But where has that gotten us? And, um, and I, I respect Professor Lau very much, of course. At the same time, you know, I, I really feel like uh, his message is, is most important at the industrial scale farmers, that they hear and they understand that they need to change their business models. We can't continue on the same way we've been going. We just can't. With, with all of these chemical inputs, for instance, um, it's, it's not the right way forward. And it's okay, not just my uh, opinion. It's a fact. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we got a few more questions. Um, sure. Do you think replicating that self-reliant community model would be possible based on the pilots given socioeconomic and geographical variables being different? Um, there's a human element playing a role in it also. Um, do, you, do you think this would be impacting your plans uh, as you have just drawn them? Uh, well, that's really the whole idea behind uh, generative design and machine learning, right? So that what gets designed and built uh, in the southern part of Sweden, which is a beautiful place, uh, right, is, is, is different, very different than what gets built, uh, you, you know, in the northern part of Vietnam, right? Uh, that you have, um, obviously, the, the, the kit of parts is going to be different because it's, it's uh, passive home typology, data and information that's relevant to that climate zone, and relevant to those building materials. You have soil and, and, and water patterns and light aspects and climate uh, ranges that are, that are specific to that uh, part of the world and also to that specific piece of land. And then culturally speaking, there's all this myriad of uh, variability right? You have all of the different kinds of concepts and constructs that you're going to deal with, culturally speaking, of how people live in their families, you know, in their family pods and their communities. And, and that will also determine the kind of layouts and the kind of uh, functionality. But the math is actually pretty similar. And I'll just say this straight out, that our math is essentially for one third of residential build, we look for two thirds of open space. And that two thirds of open space is uh, clean water, renewable energy, waste and resource management, and most importantly, just as much delicious bioavailable nutrition, a full menu that we can possibly get to on site. And, and that would allow um, in a developed economic mind, uh, mindset, probably 55 to 60% of our daily nutritional needs, right? Because we're not gonna be doing processed foods or big slaughter or anything like that. But in an emerging economy, we believe we can get to 100% nutritional input of organic bioavailable um, ingredients. And that's really, really exciting because you know, what, what uh, you know, Dr. Lau had said, Professor Lau had said was that you know, you're looking at 3 billion people, 3 billion people with a B, right? Who are facing or having food insecurity and, and nearly a billion people in addition who are 
you know, grossly uh, facing malnutrition. This is a crime against humanity. These are the same people who also are the unhoused uh, and are most vulnerable. And, and we see this especially when you look at what Regen Villages is about. The truth is, and how we met as well, right, uh, through, through the UN, is that we answer all of the 17 sustainable development goals under one umbrella, which has very, everything to do with economics, with women's rights, with child health. Um, uh, you know, I moved myself through the School of Mechanical Engineering at Stanford to now be an entrepreneur in residence in the School of Medicine in what's called the Stanford Flourishing Project for the main reason is that because we know the nuts and bolts of this work, that's not the issue. The issue is um, about money and policy, of course. So now I'm in a place where it's really about public health and about um, optimizing long-term healthy outcomes. And that's the optimistic perspective I want everybody to have, that we can do this together. We really can change our world and be, as Bucky Fuller again said, the trim tab, those little pieces on the back of a rudder. Um, you know, there's a the rudder, there's the ship, there's giant ships, and then you've got this little piece on top of the rudder that is helping the ship uh, as a little trim tab. We are those trim tabs. That's an image that I would need to visualize now. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just, to, just to move to a different aspect, because you do a lot of entrepreneurship work and and also innovation. And we're starting an accelerator tomorrow. So I want to check these innovative ideas that come out. What prevents them from being, I mean, you mentioned the policies and all, but going to investor, what would be the concerns for them to implement something like this? Oh, this is, it's never been done before. What, what, are, you, what, are, you, what are you trying to do here? <laughs> it's, it's crazy because if I said, I'm gonna drill for oil in the North Sea, in the most complicated place on earth to, to go uh, you know, several uh, thousand meters down to come up with, with something very challenging and then have these giant tankers meet that platform in the most stormiest places, somehow they can get their heads around that. But to build a neighborhood, which is pretty straightforward uh, around organic regenerative farming practices, somehow, there's this giant leap of faith. Um, but uh, there's a question here I just wanted to you know, talk about, which is about retrofits, which I think is a really important question. Um, I'm not against retrofits and I'm also not against big city. I grew up in New York City, right? So um, I, I think we, we wanna do is look at, at, at uh, retrofits in the form of overlays, right? Because you're not gonna take a building like a village that's from the 1300s, let's say, and, and make it fully sentient and regenerative and, and, and resilient in that way. What you can do is either adjacent to it or as an overlay, create the components of water, energy, waste resource management and food production. And then in the same way, we can come to urban environments and do rooftop, atrium, garage, other kinds of aspects of, um, of these, these regenerative components. So, and you're seeing now more and more because of COVID, cities are reinventing themselves. They're taking away cars. They're pouring the restaurants and the, and the shops and the, even the galleries and such onto the streets. Uh, and so all of a sudden the, the cities are becoming more livable because they're, you can walk and bike and be, feel, feel more connected. Uh, and I think that's exciting. I think that's the right way forward. So we're not talking about taking, let's say, Mumbai from 27 million people down to 5 million. No, to spread them back out to the countryside. What we're trying to say is we want to keep Mumbai from going to 50 million people, right? Or 45 million people. And instead, redirect that population back into the, to the peri-urban and the rural. And there's a very strong case for how we can do this uh, around the world. That the rural, that there's a lot of power in the peri-urban and the rural areas. They've lost that power over the years by this promise of the city delivering something to the farmers and to those communities that has drawn out their lifeblood, right? 
But now the new promise is actually back out into these areas because the new form of wealth will be, I think, the ability to feed yourself <laughs> and hydrate yourself and empower yourself. And, and you can see these examples, very low tech ways, by the way, in, in Southeast uh, India, for instance, where permaculture, whole communities are coming together and, and redefining their water capture plan so that when the monsoons do come, the water is reseeding their aquifers in such a way that these villages don't need to actually migrate uh, during the dry season to the cities for, for, for labor. They can actually stay in those places, make a living, feed themselves, and their kids can stay in school, right? This is our power. This is where we really stand strong around the world. So. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, I see some other points in here, so. Yeah, thank you very Lang. much. Hi, Lars. Good friend <laughs> yeah, of you mine. seem to have a fan base, yeah. A lot yeah, of people yeah. who know you are here, yes. <laughs> thank Sweet. you for joining us today, James. And also, I think, uh, listening to you and the, um, the concepts that you were, the region villages aspects of it, I, I could think of different, like, villages in Sri Lanka that have certain elements of it, and even indigenous groups that have certain elements of this. And I think adding that um, technological innovation to the process is what makes it both sustainable and also resilient, I believe. So that, that's definitely an interesting concept. And I, I feel like um, Resilience Frontiers, where we actually got to know each other from, might be an option to promote this further and get more ideas on expanding, I suppose. I see there's just, I have a few more minutes left. I see there's a couple of questions. One about um, the profit model. Um, I am, I am uh, a bit sneaky, and I'll just say I've never aspired to be a real estate developer. I don't know anyone who's really born who aspires to become a real estate developer, um, but I like to say often that I'm a sheep in wolves' clothing uh, when it comes to real estate development. And the primary business model that we look at is um, housing, sales, and rentals, um, and the ability, of course, then to create these um, economic drivers around these self-reliant neighborhoods. So it's, it's very traditional asset back land, residential development, which then allows these institutional funds to and sovereign wealth and pension funds who are their limited partners to invest in these kinds of projects at scale. It then also primes the pump for these industrial prefab constructors and the right um, purveyors of these kinds of systems to be able to see a supply chain in building these off-grid self-reliant neighborhoods. That's then we think the perfect triangulation to get these built uh, uh, around the world. So um, there was another uh, question that I'd seen just one before that, something about, let me just scroll up real quick. Yeah, sorry if um, I've missed any uh, oh, questions. No yeah, so I see someone said one should develop a life-centered vision uh, to develop this and um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, the best, happiest times in my life, and I think if everybody in this call thinks about what were the best, happiest times of your life, sitting at a long table with delicious food, with people that you love, eating something that you can see where it came from, having cooked it together with friends and family, Understanding those recipes represent stories of our ancestors. Eating that food and it becomes part of who we are. And then the laughter and the tears and the joy, right? That is the center of my universe. That is what I think about all the time in how I vision and imagine the world that I wanna live in. So we travel all over and have these kind of regen passports and be able to go and live and stay and be part of these communities, these healthy, vibrant communities around the world. We can live beautifully, effectively in a flourishing way on Mother Earth. Okay, 10 billion plus people can be here and not struggle, not be in deficit, but actually be in abundant surplus. But we have to act right now. We only have a few years left to get this going in the right direction. 
so that the next generations are gonna come and take this lead forward from there, right? We don't have to go to Mars or the moon as much as these billionaires think that that's the right thing to do. Um, we have actually a beautiful planet that we live on right now. So with that, I wanna thank everybody. Um, you have ways to reach me. Uh, um, you can certainly, uh, I can put it into chat just so you know uh, how to reach me. And it's pretty straightforward. It's either james at regenvillages.com or james e at stanford.edu. And of course, our website for selfless promotion is uh, regen villages.com. Hi, thank you very much for your time and getting up so early to join us today. Very appreciative. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, James. And thank you everyone uh, for joining us today as well. Have a nice morning and for everyone else, a good evening. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.